Hello, it's Scott Manley here with the other half of my technology development, uh, target for technology development. This is the heavy lifter and the interplanetary crew vehicle. Now, uh, the interplanetary crew vehicle is designed to carry crew out there and back and perhaps perform some science. It is not designed to land, albeit there are options as we have seen with EVA packs. So you can see we have 18 solid rocket motors around um, a core of six large rockets and one more large liquid engine in the middle. And on top of that, we have a the, the launch vehicle. It's 750 tons at launch. And uh, it, the launch thrust is something like 13,000 kilonewtons. Uh, the liquid engines alone develop something like 8,400 uh, kilonewtons of thrust. So the SRBs bring that up to, you know, 13,000 or something crazy. You need struts everywhere on this otherwise it will fall apart and in fact if you don't fly it properly it will fall apart if you entirely trust it to mechanical jeb it is quite likely that you will get oscillations in the stack where uh you know the thing will start to overcorrect itself and the, the oscillations will build up until it breaks so you have to watch for those um, and disable mechanical jeb if you see them uh, starting. So yeah, the, you can see a, a look of the, at the vehicle from that angle there. Now, uh, another thing to notice about this is, is my launch profile. I basically, are, are you, I'm not using the ascent autopilot. I'm using the surface and, and I'm telling it to launch at like 80 degrees and I'm basically manually telling it to pitch over. And uh, once I've pitched over enough, I'm just gonna hit the prograde button and that means that the prograde button is exactly aligned with our velocity vector. And so at that point, once we've hit that, we are going to be not wasting any fuel on any turns. That is, that is the true nature of a gravity turn during launch. So yeah, now, we're, now we are going to not do any other steering other than, let, other than what Mechanical Jeb does. We don't need to adjust. We don't need to steer. We're just thrusting along the velocity vector. Uh, which is you know, great because it's the most efficient way to do things. Now, uh, as you see, we're the uh, external liquid fuel engines are starting to run out of fuel. So we actually have to cut back on the thrust. Otherwise, that 8,400 kilonewtons is going to be pushed through too small a spaceship. And uh, the acceleration on the higher points in the stack gets too much and the spacecraft can literally concertina in on itself as the, the engines develop too much thrust and there's not enough structural strength to hold it in place. Um, if you look on the forum, somebody has developed a mod which fixes the throttle fuel consumption bug. Okay, we're going to drop these engines now. You have to be very careful. That is a hugely uh, critical moment there. If you are rotating at all, you could lose parts of your ship. I wish the decouplers could uh, be combined with some sort of system to uh, kick the, the fuel tanks away faster. But yeah, now, now we're uh, just going to time accelerate you know, in the video because at this point, the amount of thrust is, is lower than 1G. And uh, it is going to be a long process. We're just going to burn out this stack here. You see we have three fuel tanks in the middle there. Uh, and uh, um, there is a decoupler and then there is a small engine. But uh, yeah, that small engine now pushing an 88 ton rocket is going to be the thing that is going to carry us most of the way now. The, this engine is only developing 135 kilonewtons and the acceleration is is like 16 one sixteenth of a G. That is less than two meters per second. But we're in deep space. We have plenty of time. And it's also very important that the small engines in the game have the highest specific impulse values. If you have the large engine, you will get around faster, but you will burn a lot more fuel to get there. The small engines are designed to work in a vacuum. And so they are more efficient. So yeah, uh, you'll notice that uh, I've this launch trajectory is pushing my uh, escape vector from the planet Kerbin almost exactly along its orbit. I purposely waited until just after sunset to launch because this was the case. And now what I'm going to do is watch as my apoapsis or my aphelion from with respect to the sun rises until it hits uh, 29 million 577. Now that is a magic number. That is the magic number 
that if your perihelion is at Kerbin and your aphelion is at that distance, then your period of your orbit is exactly twice that of Kerbin. So if you can nail that number, when you orbit out and come back, you will exactly arrive at Kerbin, which uh, solves the planetary navigation issue, at least for this simulated um, trajectory. You know, we're going to basically fly out into deep space and come back. And the next time we want to make any course corrections, we'll basically be at the planet itself. Uh, some people like to kind of are doing simulations where they're traveling out um, and then they're circularizing their orbit and then they're coming back. But that really doesn't, um, doesn't correspond to reality because you want to be doing your burns in the presence of the target body. And uh, in, actually, in my case, I will be able to use the atmosphere of Kerbin uh, for aerobraking. But we'll talk more on that later. So I think I've nailed my orbit. I should probably fix my config to uh, show all three to show uh, three patch conics ahead. But yeah, 578. The, the only slight problem is that when you're not time accelerated is that it, it randomly changes. So I'm, I'm actually going to overcook this a little because my perihelion is slightly inside Kerbin's orbit. The important thing is that when you add both of those up and divide by two to get the semi-major axis, the semi-major axis of your orbit around Kerbal should be 21 million five hundred eighty-eight, or sorry, yeah, 28 million five hundred eighty-eight thousand four hundred three kilometers. And if you can nail that number, once you uh, get out into deep space, oh, look at this beautiful sight and watching the Plant flying away from the planet there. Uh, that's the moon. We're zipping past at quite a rate of knots. You can see the planet Kerbin behind us, and I'm sure uh, Minmus is there somewhere. Oh, yeah, I see it. Glinting away due to its lack of anti-aliasing. Yeah, you can see uh, this uh, upper stage now is uh, 77 tons. We still haven't even burned through half of one of those rings of fuel tanks, so we have plenty of fuel left. And uh, we are soon going to be in interplanetary space, and uh, the Kraken is going to be there waiting for us. Um, it's very important right now that if you're testing, that you basically nail your orbit before you get into interplanetary space, because uh, it's quite likely that your vehicle will be unsteerable once you get out there. Um, but, oh wow, it looks like I have nailed it, yeah. Um Kerbin Periaps is 16,000 kilometers, so that is close enough considering that it is several hundred days away. And so now it's time to go to full time acceleration. Now, of course, 100,000 times acceleration would take us across the Kerbin system from Minmus to the moon in uh, but a few seconds. But it is going to take us a couple of minutes to travel all the way around this orbit. Um that is unfortunate, but uh, that's the way it works, and it is 10 times faster than what we used to have. Now, I'm, a lot of people are probably wondering where I got these magical distances from. That is, you basically, to figure out the, the period of an orbit, the period of an orbit is proportional to its semi-major axis taken to the power three, and then you take the square root of that, right? So you cube it, and then you take the square root. And, you know, that's the, the orbit period equation. Now, you can take... Kerbin's uh, orbital radius, which is something like 13,600,000, and then you can figure out its period and then uh, turn that around to get the, the distance. What you do is you multiply it to get the semi-major axis of the target orbit. You take the cube root of four because you know, you're wanting two squared. So two squared is four. Take the cube root of that, that, of, of that and you get some number which you multiply by uh, 13,600,000, and it gives you 21,588,404. Now, uh, to then get what your aphelion distance is, you multiply that number by two. You multiply 21,588,000 by two and subtract Kerbin's distance because the semi-major axis is the average between the perihelion and the aphelion. So for a circular orbit the semi-major axis is equal to the orbital radius. But for an elliptical orbit, you take the difference between those two. Or you take the average between those two. And that um, it means that the aphelion has to be 29,577,000. And if you get right on that, then you will have exactly twice the period of 
carbon, and that means you will come back to its orbit exactly. And that means in part two, we can actually do the intercept. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.